So what is immunogenicity? It's the propensity of the therapeutic to generate immune response to itself and to induce um, adverse events uh, due to these immunologically related um, events. And so here's a laundry list of the different types of modalities that uh, require an immunity assessment, um, different types of biologics. So why is it important? Why is immunity testing important? Why does the agencies across the world care so much? Um, it affects safety. So you can have, and I've seen this personally with um, friends of mine that have taken uh, biologics, uh, you know, your site reactions, um, you're kind of boosting yourself every time you give a, a drug if, you, if you're having an AD response. Uh, it affects efficacy. You decrease your exposure, you increase your clearance, and um, if it's neutralizing, um, you would inhibit the functional activity of the of the drug. So there's not all ADA are created equal. Um, there are different types of ADA, and um, all all ADA are binding ADA. Um, the you know neutralizing antibody assays are less common than binding ADA, but, um, and then cross-reacting neutralizing at, um, ADA are the most dangerous. If it's, you're making, building an immune response to a native protein, endogenous protein, those are the least common, but they are also the highest risk. Uh, so all ADA uh, testing strategy is um, multi-tiered. So the first thing you would develop is a screening assay. Uh, the screening assay is going to have between um, you're shooting for statistically for a 5% false positive rate. The agency definitely wants to see false positives than um, miss um, immunity and, and see false negatives. Uh, so any any assay or any any sample that is positive in the screening assay is then going to go to the confirmatory assay, which is going to basically add more of the therapeutic to the sample and see if you have a specific uh, inhibition of that signal that you're seeing. Um, so you confirm if it's positive. If it is confirmed positive, then you report it as positive. Um, from there, the confirmatory assay, if it's if positive in the confirmatory assay, it goes into a neutralizing antibody assay um, and then a titer. And the titer assay is gonna qualitatively assess what um, the, the propensity of, of the, the immune response is. So I'm going to talk about the terminology and for immunogenicity assays. Um, these have to be developed under GLP, GCP. Um, they are qualitative. You don't have a standard curve to quantitate um, them. As I, as I spoke to before, you first start with the screening assay, which you are statistically building to have a 5% false positive rate. Uh, anything between 3 and 11% is acceptable. If you are having um, ADA, it, you know, it, once you've done your sample analysis and you're having either higher or lower than that value, you may have to go back and redevelop your assay. Uh, your confirmatory titer and neutralizing antibody assays are statistically set to have a 1% false positive rate. Uh, cut points, so cut points, this is what's being statistically determined. Anything above that cut point is gonna be deemed positive. Anything below that is gonna be deemed negative. Each of the assays has their own specific cut point. Um, if you're having issues with your assay, a lot of times you can go back and um, build an, uh, a cut point that is patient specific or study specific, and that can help um, you with any of the problems that you're having. Uh, drug tolerance, so drug tolerance is, is really important and a lot of people misunderstand this, this term. So it, it's how much of the drug um, how much of the assay can, or how much drug the assay can tolerate. So as you can see here from panel C, if you have either endogenous target or drug in the assay, um, this will interfere with the assay and it'll give a false negative. Uh, and so you won't, you won't think you have ADA in, in your assay. Um, if you don't set your drug tolerance appropriately, then you you will have to go back and totally revalidate and requalify your assay. Uh, this could be, you know, a hundred thousand to two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars mistake if if you uh, don't set drug tolerance appropriately, don't set your cut points appropriately. So it's really important to develop an appropriate assay early on so that you're not having um, 
to redevelop things later later down the road. Uh, your titer, it's basically, it's the highest sample dilution with a positive result in the assay, and you report your titer. So um, ADA titer of 200 is uh, less worrisome than a titer of, you know, 4 million. Uh, your MRD, so that's the minimum required dilution. And when you're developing the assay, you need to, you basically you dilute the assay to get rid of um, any matrix interference. You don't want to go above a 1 to 100 dilution um, because then you're diluting the sample so much you may be missing your, your ADA, but um, you need to dilute it at some point to get rid of, you know, to some value to get rid of the interference. And then you need to justify what um, dilution that you picked. Selectivity is, you know, your healthy subjects, your patient population for every indication that you're going into. So you need to evaluate those, those patient samples to see if there's anything um, specific with that patient population that could be giving you problems. And then sensitivity, you're, you're looking for at least 100 nanograms per mil sensitivity, according to guidance. Yeah. There you go. Okay. All right. So there's different ADA formats out there, and uh, these have been developed to um, help uh, achieve the drug tolerance that you're looking for. You know, if you're having to dose, you know, 100 micrograms per mil at your trough in order to see efficacy, you're going to have a hard time achieving your drug tolerance. Um, the standard is just an acid dissociation assay, usually done on MSD. Uh, the ACE method is basically washing off some of that drug. Same with the magnetic bead method. Uh, a PANDA method is a newer method that's been developed. It's also um, patented, so you need to buy a license, uh, and not all, you know, biomedical labs have the ability to run this, but it's, it's a fantastic way of achieving drug tolerance where you precipitate out the sample with um, PEG. Uh, so selecting for, so once you developed your, your tri-tiered ADA assay, plate-based assay, you need to figure out, uh, usually around phase 2B, you would like to have an AB assay available, and definitely for phase 3. And the, the format that you select is going to be based on um, the mechanism of action of your, of your target. So if you have a cellular receptor of any kind, you know, the agency is going to request or want a cell-based assay. Um, a lot of times you can piggyback off of your uh, lot release assays that CMC will develop um, to help you know, develop these, these cell based assays. They're, they're really complex. They're still done under GLP, GCP, and um, uh, it, it can be hard to get these to, to work. And, um, you know, if you can get a non cell based plate based assay, that's, that's great, the competitive ligand binding assays, but that's typically you can only justify those when it's a soluble target. Uh, if it's an enzyme, uh, you need a bioactivity assay. And, you know, what a lot of us have been working on. Um, with the, the pandemic, you know, for antivirals, um, you, you need a, a pseudoviral assay. And so these take a lot of time to develop. They're extremely expensive. It's only the, ass, only the samples that are positive, uh, confirmed positive, that go into these assays. So you might spend a lot of time and money for only a handful of samples, um, but they are required. So some considerations uh, when you're de designing your clinical trial. I always collect a PK sample when an ADA sample is collected, not vice versa. Um, you definitely need to collect pre-dose. Uh, I've had definitely had a lot of um, divisions of the FDA ask for a day 15 sample to see if you have early onset immunogenicity, uh, usually at day 29 and then monthly or bi-monthly, and definitely at the end of the study to see if you have persistent ADA. Um, so those are usually the time points that I'll, I'll collect. You definitely need more uh, intensive sampling for types of studies like a phase one, biosimilars, or formulation changes. Um, you always want to collect before you dose, so you you know limit your your drug tolerance, uh, drug interference, um, and uh, you know the incidence that you typically see could be anywhere from zero you know percent or one percent ADA uh, positive samples up to ninety percent. Um, and I consider anything under 50, 15%, you know, a low incidence. So this is a phenomenon I'm seeing time and time again, and I wanted to talk about uh, is, you know, immune tolerance. So if you think about the, you know, 
autoimmune diseases, you know, if you don't have autoimmune diseases against albumin. So the more you have a protein in your system, the more you are going to have tolerance against that protein and not make an immune response to it. And so what happens when you have low doses of a drug, of a, of a therapeutic, is you form uh, tricks, these target-related uh, immune complexes, and they are more likely to then form an ARIC, which is the ADA-related immune com complex. So when you have monoclonal antibody or therapeutic in excess, you're, you're much more likely to uh, develop tolerance to that and not develop an immune response to it. As you can see here, um, this is some generic uh, non-clinical and clinical data, and I've definitely seen this time and again. You know, your low-dose monkey group will have a lot more ADA incidence than your, your high-dose group. And that's not just related to the drug tolerance, because you should understand, and you know, even for your non-clinical GLP assays, understand your drug tolerance. Um, and you, you should be able to, at the trough, be able to detect the ADA. So it really is this low dose thing, and, and you'll see it in your, your early cohorts and um, your clinical study as well. Mm -hmm.